Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting of October 14th, 2015. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you very much. And could we have the roll call by the town clerk? Chairman Ray? Here. Councilor Grennan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. Councilor Wagner? And Councilor Walsh? Here. Thank you very much. Um, so we will move on to town council reports and correspondence. And we have a very special presentation tonight. I want to recognize Senator Millett for a presentation from the um, governor. Legislature. Legislature, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I recognize you have a very full agenda this evening, so I will try to keep this as brief as I can. But um, I first just want to commend the hard work and creativity of the 250th anniversary committee members. Um, who have worked so hard and so diligently on creating such a wonderful event for our town. Um, that's Carol Ann Jordan, Darren McClellan, Norm Jordan, Jan Beckwith, Stephanie Nutt, Catherine Adams, Barbara Powers, and volunteers Debbie Butterworth and Kathy and Randy Blake. The celebration has been a del delightful collection of ways to celebrate the many unique and special places and people of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'm sure that the final event at the Inn by the Sea on the actual date, uh, November 11th, uh, of our incorporation will be equally wonderful. Um, we are so fortunate to have so many enthusiastic citizens and supportive partners to make the 250th celebration um, the, how, as special as it has been and the success that it is. Cape Elizabeth is a treasure, and I'm sure that we all feel blessed to live amid such beauty and within such a strong community. And so with that, um, I would like to read uh, as quickly as I can uh, a legislative sediment from the um, 126th legislature. Be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, join in recognizing the town of Cape Elizabeth on the 250th anniversary, anniversary of its incorporation. In 1765, the residents of what is now Cape Elizabeth and South Portland, including all the area lying south of Portland Harbor and east of the Spurwink River, petitioned to separate from Portland to form their own government. The land was named Cape Elizabeth in 1615 in honor of Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, sister of King Charles of England. Throughout its 400-year history, Cape Elizabeth has retained a rural character reflecting its agricultural origins. Today, Cape Elizabeth has more parkland and permanently dedicated open space than any other community in Cumberland County. We join the good citizens of the town of Cape Elizabeth in celebrating the semi-quintennial <laughs> of its incorporation and send our best wishes and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 127th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. And it's signed by the President of the Senate and the Secretary of the Senate, Speaker of the House and Clerk of the House. So. Um, it's a wonderful way to recognize our wonderful history, and if I'm Kathy, I'll give that to you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. We really appreciate your time and having come this evening. So, I will move on to town council reports and correspondence. Are there anybody who has anything to say at this point? Jim. Well, a couple of things. First, um, we had the privilege, uh, a couple of us who uh, attended the um, museum store volunteers appreciation banquet last week. 
and uh, a wonderful event uh, with uh, with the volunteers who really man that facility out there uh, and have 28 38 45 buses show up and they're uh, smiling faces and, and making it happen out there to, to had people visit this wonderful asset of Cape Elizabeth. But we had a wonderful evening, uh, some, uh, a chance to get to know some of the folks, and they come from as far away as Wyndham to actually work, uh, volunteer their time in that store. So it's pretty neat um, to experience that, but I, I thought it was a wonderful evening. So, Secondly, um, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission has um, uh, this correspondence to, to the chair and to the town manager. And this will be taken up at the next meeting. Uh, but basically, um, we have uh, discovered in our deliberations uh, the, a, a fairly new sport that has taken hold here. It's pickleball. And um, how pickleball and tennis either coexist or do not coexist on the same court. So the Fort Williams Advisory uh, commission has, um, has asked the town council to uh, take this up as a town-wide issue and you've received a letter from us. I believe you received it already and it will be on the agenda at the next meeting but I wanted to make sure <coughs> that uh, that was mentioned this evening because we have another uh, commission meeting tomorrow evening and I'd like to report that it effectively has been handed over to the town council for consideration. Thank you. Thank you Jim. Others? <coughs> Uh, Jessica. I'd just like to point out that in two and a half weeks, it's Sunday, November 1st, which is the actual 250th birthday. <laughs> so this is the last town council meeting before Cape Elizabeth's 250th birthday. And again, I'd like to thank the committee that's worked so hard all year and um, commemorated this with some wonderful events. <clears throat> thank you. Anyone else? Um, I'm going to add that. Um, the town council survey responses are in from the um, <coughs> items that were in the text bill and also to be online. And um, Michael has given us a copy, and this copy will be presented online tomorrow. tomorrow. So um, anyway, I'll just give you the overview. Uh, one item was the Goddard Mansion. and There were a total of 410 people that wanted it stabilized, 223 people that want it sold or in, uh, encumbered, 102 that want it demolished, and 58 that were other. Um, so the total response for question one was 735. Uh, question two was in reference to the original library building, and which I also call the Sperling School. Um, and currently our library is located there temporarily while we are doing our renovations. <clears throat> so there were 142 people that wanted it demolished. There were 416 people that wanted it for public use. There were 196 people that wanted it in the private sector and there were 53 people that wanted other. Uh, and the third question was about the town center intersection. Uh, there were a total of 679 people that responded to that. There were 385 people that said there were no problem. There were 294 that said they wanted a public, public dialogue. And there were 120 people that wanted other. And um, there were also some pie charts that go along with that. And as Michael said, that will be on tomorrow for people who want to read that and take a look at that further. So I uh, thank everybody who has responded. Um, it's really helpful when we know what uh, the general population wants, and I think it was great to put it in the tax bill so that people were paying attention, because I think they pay attention to their tax bills. So anyway, thank you. And uh, we will move on to the Finance Committee report. Uh, Jim? So in your packet, you, um, you have that eye chart with 19 pages of all of our budget uh, issues, but, but we also have the dashboard, which uh, which uh, uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at. And again, just to call out a couple of pieces of the, of the dashboard. Um, essentially, our you know, excise taxes are up. Um, people uh, buying new vehicles, moving into town, um, it's up by 11%. Um, and uh, in that same category in the revenue areas, we're, we're ex you know, experiencing revenue uh, sharing that's up. Our building permits are down. Uh, franchise fees are even. 
and state school subsidies are um, also up. Um, highlighting the, uh, the museum gift shop sales. Um, year on year, we've got an increase of about $36,000. Um, so again, weather is a huge factor in how that business works. Uh, real positive, and again, it's important for people to realize that all those dollars go back into, uh, into the park. Um, and on the expenditure side, um, one of the highlights of, uh, of our overspend was the overtime that was incurred as a result of us hosting a lot of people at the Ford for the tall ships. And uh, that was totally unbudgeted uh, and not, uh, not something that we had any um, real advance notice about. But we wound up uh, forcing our public works staff to work that weekend. Um, there was uh, a lot of overtime incurred as well. So, um, but I think it's important for people to understand that uh, this, this is on the website, this uh, dashboard. We've been using it for most of this year. And, uh, as I leave after next meeting, I hope that you continue to use it and continue to improve upon it because it does give you a snapshot in time as to what's taking place in the town. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Any counselors have any questions for Jim? No. Okay, great. Um, then I'll move on to the audited financial statements for June 30th, 2015. Mike, did you want to make a comment about that? Yeah, just. Uh our audit report is now available online. It will be listed under reports under government on, on our website. And the town council will be meeting with the, the auditors uh, on the 26th of October at 7 o'clock to review the, the annual financial statements for June 30, 2015. Thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike? No. Okay. Uh, we will move on then to citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. We have a busy agenda tonight, and I think most people are here about agenda items, but if there's anybody who wants to speak about something that's not on the agenda, please come up to the podium, state your name and address, and you have three minutes. Chris McCarthy, 9 Salisbury Lane. 15 years ago, the town of Cape Elizabeth amended its existing zoning ordinance. The amendment permitted the use of existing listed structures to site telecommunications equipment. <clears throat> Among the structures listed was water towers, which at the time and still now only includes the water tower at Avon Road. This allowed for what should have been quick, cost-effective solutions while minimizing impacts to the town vision or individual rights of residents. But instead, the town rejected recent Verizon and AT&T applications to add antenna and ground structures to the existing water tower and facilities at Avon Road on the grounds that the actions would not comply with the town ordinance. Verizon appealed the decision and after rejection of appeal by the town zoning board, they filed a lawsuit against the town. The recent court ruling by U.S. District Court Judge Levy clearly and logically explained why Verizon's application should not have been rejected. The key arguments in the town's defense were discussed and denied in the judge's court order issued September 30th. The judge's order rejects the notion that the tower has no current primary use. The order stated further that Verizon's proposal as an accessory use is valid under the ordinance regardless of whether or not the SCADA system itself is an accessory or primary use. The potential for the tower to be torn down was also discussed. The Avon Road facilities include a communication system monitoring raw sewage. Failure of the system could result in flooded basements and millions of gallons of sewage entering Casco Bay. As such, indications are that the SCADA system will operate indefinitely. The judge's opinion also rejects the notion that maintenance activity would increase substantially as Verizon confirmed maintenance would be a monthly visit. The judge also rejected the notion that the proposal by Verizon with its shrouded antenna would become the physically dominant use of the property. The town has recently been made aware of a petition signed by over 200 residents supporting the use of the Avon Road facilities for cell phone antennas. During the recent open town meeting, the brainstorm 2016 goals, 2016 goals, there were repeated requests for the issue of cell coverage to be addressed in timely fashion. The town governance is now undeniably aware of the wishes of its residents. With the court ruling, there is no reason to reject the Ver Verizon application. So once resubmitted, I urge the town code enforcement officer and planning board to approve Verizon's application immediately. Approving permits to add communications equipment at the Avon Road facilities 
represents the quickest, most cost-effective solution to an established concern of Cape Elizabeth residents. I further request that tax dollars not be spent appealing the decision. Questions I'm hoping might get answered this evening are, is the town planning to appeal the court decision? If not, can the process and schedule for addressing this matter be laid out for the residents? And do you intend to put this on the planning board's agenda? Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Is there anybody else who would like to speak about items not on the agenda? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You have three minutes. My name is Gwen Rivers, 49 Shipwreck Cove Road. I'm just going to add to what Chris said. Um, when Verizon requests permit for cell coverage at the water tower, I ask that you move it onto the planning board. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Being repetitive. My name is Oriel Offit. I live at Nine Ironclad. I want to say the exact same thing. When Verizon requests a permit for cell coverage of the water tower, I ask that you move it on to the planning board. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> uh, Michelle Frost, Three Peoples Cove Road. Um, I likewise request that you uh, move Verizon's request for. Um, the antenna to go into the Avon Road water tower onto the planning board. Thank you. Anyone else? Aubrey Miller to Pine Ridge Road, and I will simply echo those same requests. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry you folks are taking so long. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, then I will move on to the town manager's monthly report. Michael. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ray. I wanted to uh, give a report. Actually, the first, second thing on my list was the Verizon lawsuit, but I'll, I'll take it up first since uh, there does seem to be some public interest in it. Uh, you know, I think everyone's aware of the court decision uh, issued by the United States District Court. Uh, in uh, Verizon versus the town of Cape Elizabeth, or whatever the case was called, uh, you know, it, it, you know, the, the case was decided. Uh, the, the the judge actually was able to go to the hearing that he did, and he seemed to be a very fair judge. Seemed to hear, hear the issues, the cases. The town, uh, you know, was being sued by Verizon. Or they took action against the town. Uh, there was also some neighbors who intervened in the case, and they also had a chance to be heard at the hearing. The, the, the judge, uh, you know, seemed very interested in the case, very interested in the issues, uh, r did render an opinion uh, that, that, that sided with the town on a, a portion of the issue, but, you know, as Mr. McCarthy indicated and others, on the other side of the issue, he, the, the judge very much uh, decided with Verizon in terms of feeling that, that, uh, that these are an allowed use, uh, you know, in, in that the town's ordinance as it reads allows it. Which, you know, it's the, the town could appeal that decision. I haven't heard anyone indicate interest in appealing the decision. If the town council did want to appeal it, there'd have to be some positive action this evening or the appeal period would run. In. And if, if, if I might, could I defer to Ben McDougall, the code officer, to indicate what he feels would be the next steps, uh, assuming the council is not appealing? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Good evening. Assuming the council doesn't appeal, uh, I would, upon Verizon's request, refer the issue to the planning board, and then the planning board process would play out. As soon as that approval is obtained, I would issue the building permit for the intents. Thank you, Ben. Um, does it, I, maybe I'll ask um, the question, do you have any, any sense of time frame? I know lots of people want it yesterday. And I know you probably can't exactly say what the time frame is, but ballpark? Well, uh, Verizon hasn't reached out to me yet, so I don't, no. you know, for, they, they first need to, you know, come forward <clears throat> and request to move the issue forward. And, uh, and, and then it goes into the planning board's hands, and I, I can't speculate on the planning board process. Just to that point, we have not been, neither Ben nor I have reached out to Verizon because the council still had the opportunity to issue an appeal and we still needed to get by this meeting before we engaged with Verizon. 
Chair. Yeah, if, Chair. if the council chooses not to appeal, you know, we'll, we'll engage Verizon, and if, if they want to move forward, it'll be immediately referred to the planning board. Okay. Jim, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe Michael could answer that. Since there were neighbors who intervened, do they have the same ability to appeal on the same timeline? My understanding. Okay. Yes. So it's not just the council that can appeal it. There are others that can appeal it. Yeah, yeah other part, you know, Verizon could appeal it because they may not like the portion of the decision that deals with the Spectrum Act. Or the neighbors could appeal it on, on I suppose, on any grounds since uh, they were interveners as well. <clears throat> we have not heard any indication from either party that they plan to appeal. Thank you, Mike. Anything else from councilors? Do you need a motion? You know, you know, if, you know by, by your silence, you're indicating you don't want to appeal. But if the council wishes to take a, a proactive vote, uh, take up an item out of order to do that, you're, you're welcome to do that. I would defer to the look at the chairman and the council. What do you think? I mean. um, it's up to you folks, always. <clears throat> Jessica. Well, if the chairman would entertain a motion, yes. then I would move that the town council uh, does not appeal the district court's decision. Thank you, Jessica. Is there a second? <coughs> Caitlin? Second. Okay. Discussion? You know, I think technically, you need to suspend the rules to take up an item out of order and then consider yeah. the order. Okay. Do we need to have a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. Second. Thank you. Anybody disagree with the motion to suspend? All right, all in favor to suspend the rules. Thank you. Jim, did you want to make your original motion? Uh, Jessica, sorry. With pleasure, I, I move that the town council not appeal the district court's decision. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Caitlin. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Okay. Do we need a motion to go back to the original rules, or is that just asking? <laughs> Do you want to go back to the time manager's report? Do we have to go back to the original rules, is this question? No, no, no. No, okay. Uh, no. I just want to. <laughs> so we will go back to the town manager's monthly report? Yeah, the, the, the second item I, I did want to mention is note the passing of Lee Chase. Uh, Lee, Lee was uh, one of the founding members of our fire police unit. And what the fire police unit is, is the group that if you have accidents in town or you have fires, they're the, the men and women who stand in direct traffic and help out the police department. We see them at special events, whatever. And you, at the fire department recognition dinner, the, the last one they had uh, last May or whenever it was, Lee was recognized for 25 years of service. Uh, and uh, he, at that point, he was still very active in the fire police unit. And you know, just a great person. His uh, wife, Edna, uh, used to work here in the town office. Uh, in the excise office, I think a lot of folks know Edna. So uh, it's a you know sad loss for the community. He was a great guy and really did a lot of volunteer service for our community as well as you know in his full time occupation, which was he was a traffic engineer for the main department of transportation, and uh, we work closely with him there as well. So we'll miss Lee. Thank you, Mike. That's it. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> um, I remember that last time somebody said to me that my voice was too soft. So can the folks in the back hear me? If you can, could you raise your hand? OK, thank you so much. I'll try to be louder. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you. Um, so we will move on to review of the draft minutes of the September 14th, 2015 meeting. Is there a motion to approve? I Jim. Move, I move that we accept the draft minutes of September 14th, 2015. Thank you. Is there a second? Patty. Second. Thank you. Um, any comments, errors, omissions? No? All right. All in favor? Great. All right. So we move on to item 105, which I think everybody is here to, um, in interest this evening. Um, first of all, this item was tabled on September 14th, so I need a motion to take it off the table. Is there a motion? Jim. I move that we take it off the table. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Jessica, any discussion? No. All in favor? All right. It's off the table. So um, we are moving on to the uh, recommendation from the Fire Range Committee and a draft motion from the town's attorney. 
which I believe we all have and which is also on the website for those who um, are in the audience. So, um, is there a motion? Jessica. I, if I'm saying this correctly, I move that we accept the findings of fact uh, on block. Thank you. Is there a second? Caitlin. Second. Thank you. Discussion. Let me see if there's public comment. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I apologize. Um, we should do public comment as well. Um, so I will ask if there's public comment. Um, if there is, come up to the podium, give your name and address. You have three minutes. You'll hear my phone go off. Um, we normally would do this for 15 minutes because we already had a public hearing on this. Um, if there are more people than five, um, I will ask the council if they want to entertain additional time for folks. So um, we will start with um, Chair, Cammie. Chair, just yes. a question. Yes, sir. Um, um, I just uh, as a matter of um, practice, um, you may want to elaborate on um, behavior and uh, how that works. Um, okay, I will. Um, on the agenda that is in the back of the room, normally, um, we ask that folks um, keep, let's see, let's see. Persons present at council meetings shall not applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or actions taken at such meeting. Persons at council meetings may only address the town council after being recognized by the chair. So I will rem remind folks that um, they're not to address the audience, they're to address us. And um, please make sure that you state your opinions, but you don't take shots at other people in the room. And there's no clapping, booing, and other such things. So thank you for reminding me, Thanks. Jim. Thanks. Tammy. Hello, my name is Tammy Walter. I live at 1095 Sawyer Road in Cape Elizabeth. I'm the president of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Much in Cape Elizabeth has changed since the 1950s when the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club was founded. The town has changed in land use, demographics, and population, but what has not changed is the underlying desire of those men who founded the club. The 70 men who began the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club set forth a vision in their founding charter that their purpose was to establish better conditions for the safety of sportsmen. If our founding members were here now, they might not recognize the club for all the changes that have been made. I do believe, though, that those founding members, among them, Appleton, Burton, Benoit, Bean, Layton, Maxwell, Murray, McGowan, Peebles, Strout, <coughs> Thurston, and Winslow, the Coxes, the Denisons, the Jordans, and the Kennedys, those men would recognize that their commitment to safety remains as firm today as it did when the club was founded. Over the years, these families and others have formed lasting friendships. Fathers and sons have spent thousands of quality hours together involved in club activities. Today, entire families are involved. Hunting, fishing, shooting, social events, monthly dinners, weekly get-togethers, as well as camping, hiking, and boating. The Spurwink Rod and Gun Club is actively involved in our community and is a part of the fabric and history of Cape Elizabeth. In the summer, we send children to 4-H camp. We have a junior shooting team, and five of our teenagers received state gold medals. One of our teenagers received a full college scholarship for shooting sports. We teach children and young adults basic fishing skills. In December, our club will be involved in the Toys for Tots campaign. We have always wanted to be good neighbors. We have shown tremendous willingness to change, adapt, and improve. We have spent countless hours, ceaseless effort, and significant funds towards that goal. To take that away is to diminish all of us and our community. My hope is that we can come together, the town, our community, and our neighbors. Ultimately, we want to enjoy our club, to continue the good works our members do for the community, to gather together, to enjoy our friendships and our families, and to be a place that Cape Elizabeth can point to with pride. Thank you. Next. Yes, sir. Evening. My name is uh, Tony Alvis, 19 Eastman Road. 
I'm a retired Marine officer, a former fighter pilot, and now flying internationally for a major airline. I'd like to share some thoughts about safety since we seem to be talking about that a lot. At the Naval Postgraduate School, I was trained as an aviation safety officer. There we were taught to examine the hard data and facts to eliminate a lot of the emotional issues that sometimes come up in solving a problem. Case in point is the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Find a six year history with zero injury or deaths outside the club's boundaries. After I wrote a letter to the editor of the Cape Courier, I received this uh, anonymous letter, actually it was a copy of a police report from 2009, complaining of a bullet hitting a Cross Hill residence. The officer uh, investigating described the bullet as a low velocity, striking the side of the home in a downward trajectory. Most likely a shot uh, fired overhead or a negligent discharge, and he said probably from a 38 round from the size of uh, the bullet. Since the club was in pro uh, close proximity, he said it probably came from the range, although there's no proof that it ever did. It may have come from anywhere, and no one was struck, although the complainant claims that other houses in the area have been struck. The report does state that no other reports of police records or any other such incidents have been reported. So despite this claim, I'll still stick with the 100% safety record as far as injuries and deaths for the Sparrowing Club. Another thought comes to mind. If I were to build a house and moved into it that abutted another structure or home that had been there for 50 or so years, that had an activity that I perceived was a danger or a threat to me and my family, but moved next door anyway, well, you know what, that's on me. If through my pers uh, persuasion or harassment, I was able to get my neighbor to make significant and costly modifications to his property to alleviate, again, my concerns, no factual data, uh, then maybe I would go ahead and lend a hand because what he's doing is in my interest, not his. I might provide some labor, maybe some financial support. It's because of this I'm afraid of his activity or that I don't like the noise that it generates. Well, as far as I understand, the neighbors have not provided any support. As a fact, there have been numerous attempts to interfere with the club's efforts to satisfy the new safety requirements in construction. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Next. Jim Richard, Nine Cross Hill Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, there have been three houses that have been struck. There's also been one accidental discharge at the range that actually struck somebody uh, that was documented by Mr. Mayone's IFW application so let's get it straight that this is a real issue and that safety is a major concern. You have drawings before you from L&L Structural Engineering and our design works that show a partially contained no blue sky range. That does not meet the requirements of the ordinance. It will not contain the rounds on their property. Um, just because your neighbor was there first does not give him the right to throw his garbage onto your lawn or run over your lawn or park in your driveway. It is time to basically deal with the facts. The facts are that that drawing, as is, does not meet the requirements. When you're voting on this, take that into consideration. Uh, and let's not kick the can down the road. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Just remind folks to try to speak into the microphone, because I'm having a hard time hearing you, so others might as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ed Nadeau, and I live at 9 Apple Tree Lane. A um, couple of quick comments. Uh, that was a very impressive list of activities that go on at the club. And there was only one that has any impact, that this ruling has any impact, and that's actually firing guns. Their social activity, the hiking, the training, virtually everything else that they do, which is, which is wonderful. I don't disagree. But I guess I keep hearing from newspaper articles and public comments that somehow we're trying to shut down the club. All we want is a safe range. What you had, I'm one of those people who moved there knowingly. I lived in town. I knew there was a gun range there. Uh, my wife and I built our home there. It was part of the rural character. 
Five years ago, it all changed. Expression I believe the gun club uses, they decided to put their big boy pants on and become a larger facility. The scale has changed dramatically. It's not, if, if you want to say who was there first, our neighborhood was approved 20 years ago. As, and across the street, you had Farm Edge Road, which was there for 30 years. So, you know, it, it, they had 30 years to adapt to the fact that they had a firing range and all these other gun club activities, which were a non-issue to anyone. They had all these other activities and the firing range evolve into what, what they're attempting to grow in today is something of a regional resource. Again, their words from an uh, inland fisheries and wildlife application. So I beg to differ. We were there first. We were there before they decided to put their big boy pants on. Um, I, you know, it, anyway, it's incumbent upon you to review, review all the safety information. I agree with Mr. Richard. Uh, there is a disconnect, which I believe I've shared with, with the council. There's a disconnect between the option five drawing that Richard LaRosa provided and what has been approved as a billing commitment. And I have great concern of that in finding of fact 14. One other comment, finding of fact 11, um, that is not based in fact. The, the, the Fire Range Committee reviewed a, in the application, there's two pages. Those two pages are purported to be from EPA uh, 920, which is the current lead management source document, which is referenced in the ordinance that, that has to meet or exceed. I contend that it doesn't. As a budding a wetland, there are, there are numerous references in that publication that make it clear that things like embankments, uh, detention ponds, dams, and, and there's a number of, of things that need to be done in order to put that into conformance. All I ask the council to do is to do the same thing they had done with the safety. Uh, no disrespect to the fire range committee, but it became apparent that they didn't have the qualifications to make a judgment on fire range safety. I contend that you know, the finding is the same in terms of the EPA. At the, the EPA publication makes it very clear it is not a substitute for uh, professional guidance from engineers. Uh, I think I hear, the, uh, I hear the magic chime, but you, you get the point. It's, 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 thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nadeau. I'll, one second, sir. I'll remind the council that this gentleman will be the fifth person, and I see at least five more people. So the council needs to think about um, if they want to, uh, add another 15 minutes. I, I'd, I'd like to, to move yep. that we add another 15 minutes. I think people should have their say. Okay. I'll Just, second. Okay. Anybody disagree with this? Uh, let's, let's vote on it. All in favor? Okay. So we'll add another 15 minutes. Thank you, sir. No problem. Step up. <coughs> Hello. My name is Clint Jackson. I'm from 10 Robinson Road in South Portland. I'm a member of the Spurlink Rod and Gun Club. And one of the things that is a key word here is safety and I think that with everything that is happening especially at midnight tonight with the concealed carry laws taking away another place for training and practice and safe use of firearms won't help the concerns of the state of Maine as a whole if you Everybody seems to be very concerned and have their own opinions about the universal carry laws and keeping a place where people can get that training and safety open is probably vital to the community as a whole as well as the club members. Like we have excellent people who can give classes and teach people how to properly use their firearms and people are going to carry them whether they have the training or not. So if we can offer them the training and make it available to them, then I only see that as a positive for the community. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, jo <coughs> excuse me. Jonathan Good, uh, Ashbourne Corp, South Portland, Maine. Uh, member of the club for over 20 years. I can't remember back that far. But uh, I was here at the last meeting, my first meeting I, I, I attended here, and uh, I listened to all the arguments. We've hashed this stuff over and over and over again. It's time to make a decision. I'm here to urge you issue a license for this club. 
You've heard all the answers. You have a range committee. You've passed an ordinance, which is legal. You have a range committee given recommendation. You've been through all this stuff before. The bottom line is we have folks who bought houses next to a gun range, like you wouldn't put a house next to a railroad track, a nuclear power plant, or anything else if you didn't want to live there. And now they're trying to find any way possible to keep this from reopening and fire, having live fire again. You've, you've heard all the arguments. You have an ordinance. You have a range committee recommendations. There's no reason I can see from what I've heard reasonably or logically not to issue a license tonight to let this club get on with its, with its proposed building and its uh, range efforts to keep it safe in accordance with Mr. LaRose's plans. That club is doing that now, and that takes care of all the issues that have been accepted by all the parties, except for a few dissenters. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, Ty Matheson, Burwell Labs, South Portland, a member of the Rod and Gun Club. <clears throat> Rick LaRosa said the range, if used as intended, provides proper shot containment. Residents have also said that they fear to walk down the streets with their children in, through this neighborhood. I'd like to provide some food for thought. Cross Hill Road and many other roads like them, if used in as intended, provide a safe way for residents to use their vehicles. Should the town of Cape Elizabeth install barriers between the roads and sidewalks to provide safety for the children? Of course not, because we entrust drivers to use the roads as intended. <clears throat> I ask of the council to grant the club the license to allow us as members to safely use our club as it has been intended for over 60 years. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Eric Stephanus, uh, 2 Tiger Lily Lane, South Portland. Um, excuse me, everyone says uh, uh, 2 Tiger Lily Lane, Cape Elizabeth. Um, the, uh, I, I just wanted to clarify something, because I, 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 I think that a lot of the misunderstanding and the, and the drama that we have around this might, uh, you know, might stem from a basic misconception. So I just wanted to clarify that, that if people even realize there is a difference between the rod and gun club and the firing range, uh, they are not the same thing. The rod and gun club is a corporation registered by the state of Maine. The firing range is licensed by the town of Cape Elizabeth. Two different things. As stated in item number one of the draft motion under consideration, quote, the SRGC owns and operates a shooting range facility. So when you vote against this motion tonight, if you do, you are not voting to shut down the club. The club will continue, it will be open tomorrow. The shooting range is ancillary to the club, although you'd never know it by listening to the rhetoric. At the last town council meeting, for instance, you know, Mark Mayone said, uh, quote, they have one goal. They don't want a gun club to exist in their backyard. And he referred to, quote, the hardships that have resulted from closing our club. The club is not closed. All the things that uh, Ms. Walter itemized uh, a few minutes ago can go on. All the, all the other activities can continue. The firing range and the club are distinct. So yesterday, I came here to have my car registered downstairs. For a, uh, my car has a problem with the brakes, which I'm having fixed now. So the person at the front desk said to me, well, don't worry, I'll give you a conditional registration. No, they didn't really say that. Um, of course they wouldn't say that, right? Uh, in my experience, everyone at the front desk knows their job and they do it well. And they would not register my car without an inspection certificate because public safety is involved. So we have a, an analogy here, I think. I own a car. The club owns a shooting range. My car's brakes are broken. The shooting range has safety deficiencies. I need to have them fixed before I can get inspected and registered. The club needs to fix those deficiencies before they can get their range inspected and licensed. It seems to me to be really that simple. All of the people who have been asking you not to grant the license until 100% shot containment is achieved are Cape Elizabeth residents. All of them. Only a third of the club members are residents. You are the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. You're not the club council. You're not the South Portland Council. So listen to the preponderant voice of your constituents and do not grant the license at this time. You can grant it after the deficiencies have been fixed. Uh, there is really no reason that I can see to do otherwise. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mark Mayone, past president, Spurwink Ron and Gun Club. Recently, the Spurwink Ron and Gun Club contracted MIA Environment environmental to do a water testing of our property. I'd like to read, from, read to you from that report. As requested, MAI Environmental collected two surface water samples from the drainage way that crosses northwest to southeast through the range property, directly across our ranges. The two samples, SW1 and SW2, were collected on October 5, 2015 and submitted to the Maine Environmental Laboratory, Yarmouth, Maine, for lead testing. SW1 was collected at the upgradient property line where the drainage enters the Spurwink Run and Gun Club property. SW2 was collected at the downgradient property line where drainage exits the Spurwink Gun Club property. Based on the results, the upgradient water sample, SW1, showed a trace amount, 0 0.001, concentration of lead, and the downgradient sample was non-detect. For comparison, the state of Maine drinking water standard for lead is 0 0.01, which is an order of magnitude greater than the reported surface water concentration of 0 0.001. Um, I have to say, the irony of this sample is the water that comes into our property from the Cross Hill neighborhood is the one with the smallest trace of lead detectable and leaves our property with no trace of lead. This is kind of funny. The primary mission of the Springbank Rod and Gun Club of safety and sportsmanship was central in my life last weekend. I went away with my son and longtime friends hunting. Being able to hunt safely with my children started at the Springbank Rod and Gun Club. A quick, clean harvest is the ethos of every good hunter. This is what I teach my children. This is what we preach at the club. Because my son and I had a place to practice, we were able to ethically har harvest our game. There are many reasons for many people why the club should be here. If people can't come here, where are they going to go to practice safety? And that is why I take so passionately what I do over at the club. Because truly, I think it's important that people have a place to practice safety, practice shooting safely. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. <coughs> Kathy Klein, 66 Cross Hill Road. I want to echo some of what Mr. Stephanus said previously. Um, I think that the club should continue to um, have their social gatherings. Yeah, maybe people can't hear you. Oh, okay. Can you yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. There you go. I just want to echo what Mr. Stephanus said before. I think the club should certainly continue to conduct their social gatherings, community service, um, I think that's a wonderful thing for the community, but I also want to encourage the council to consider um, holding off on issuing a conditional license until we have all our questions about safety answered. I think that is more important um, because ultimately, I think you're charged with um, protecting the safety of our town. Um, and I don't think that we need to rush this um, and issue a license until we know that the safety issues have been met entirely. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Mark Doring. I live at 10 Highview Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm also a member of the Rod and Gun Club, and I use the range um, maybe a couple times a year, and that's my involvement there. Can you speak my, up just a little, sir? I'm happy. Sure. Thank you. Um, my concerns here are more from the town perspective with some knowledge about guns and safety around guns and a safe place to shoot. Um, I, I applaud the town council and the town manager for doing the due diligence on a very emotional issue to bring in a third party consultant, an expert, to weigh in on how to make that range safe. It is not a perfect world. I'm here as an example of that. So there will never be a perfect scenario where there won't be danger. There's great training there. 
but you've hired your third party consultant he's put together a plan the club has brought that consultant in to also address the same issues he's architect a plan to address what came in the report to make it as safe as possible i have never seen a gun range with so much stuff on it in my life so i applaud you for what you've done so far I don't think every, uh, you, we're going to make everybody happy here. There's people who clearly want the club shut down, and I understand that. There's clearly people who don't want the club to change a bit, and I understand that. But I applaud you. I think you've done the right thing. I would ask that you move forward to let the club reopen based on addressing <coughs> what was architect by the person who did your report as an expert. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ralph. <clears throat> my name is Ralph Romano, 12 Tiger Lily Lane, and uh, I, I support you giving a license to the Rod and Gun Club tonight. Uh, I, I think they've made good progress over there. I think they've done a lot. But a separate issue is whether shooting should be allowed again until those improvements are complete, and they're not complete. They don't have shot containment yet. So those are two different things. But I'm sure they will if they keep up at the rate that they're going. I think then shortly they should have what they want and be allowed to shoot. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things that bothers me is it keeps coming up about how people build houses next to a rod, a rod and gun club. And, I, and, and uh, why would they do that if they were afraid? Well, once again, I'll tell you that I've lived in Cape, I built my first house in Cape Elizabeth 42 years ago. And I've known the Rod and Gun Club was there for at least 50 years. But I didn't know it was unsafe until we got La Rosa's report. I had heard stories about bullets striking houses, and I don't know. I mean, I, sometimes you take that with a grain of salt. You wonder, is that real? Isn't it? What? But once you got La Rosa in here and he made his report, then we knew it was unsafe. But by then, there were already 90-something houses built over there in, in Cross Hill. So you can't blame the people. I mean, how would we know that the town would allow that development to be constructed if the town thought that that rod and gun club was unsafe? Obviously, the town didn't think it was unsafe. Neither did the residents who bought. I mean, this was all news to us. One other item, I'm, I'm kind of concerned. I sent an email, I don't know if you all got it before the meeting, but I'd like to read it to you. Uh, <clears throat> It considers one point that I think is kind of, uh, it's, it's about money, and I consider that important. And it's, uh, my email said, Dear Counselors, at the last meeting of the Spurwink Club's application for licensing, there seemed to be confusion among counselors on whether the club or the town pays for certain items. And as a refresher, I e emailed you section 24-8-2, of the shooting range ordinance, which states, there shall be no application fee, but the applicant shall be responsible to reimburse the town for engineering and other professional services needed to review the application. Now, I understand the town has paid Mr. LaRosa approximately $8,000 for his professional services, but a decision has been made not to seek reimbursement as clearly required by the ordinance. Now, when, where, and by whom this decision to ignore the, audience, the ordinance was made is not clear. This decision should have been publicly discussed and a vote taken so taxpayers can see who is in favor of declining the $8,000 reimbursement and which counselors favor following the requirements of the ordinance. That Mr. LaRose's professional services were a necessary, critical factor in evaluating the application should not be in doubt. He clearly established there was a physical problem and provided valuable information on what corrective action was necessary. Before receiving his report, the Firing Range Committee voted almost unanimously to approve licensing. Mr. After the town received the report, the Firing Range was immediately shut down. I got two sentences. That should obviously Mr. establish the importance of his professional services Could you to evaluate this application. The problem was much more in depth than a lack of proper paperwork. Could you Thank finish you. up? Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. 
And I'll just mention to the council that we're actually at 7.55, but I see one additional person. Are we all right to uh, continue? Yep. Thank you. I'll be really quick. My name is Alexa Ward. I live at 1095 Sawyer Road. And I just, I think the man that spoke before me made this point, but I just wanted to clarify for any of the <coughs> residents that didn't understand, I didn't really understand this until today, but the licensing of the club is, a, is separate than the club actually opening up for live fire. So they're not, if the licensing gets approved, it doesn't mean that they're going to be able to shoot again until all the safety requirements have been met. So I just wanted to clarify that for anybody. Thank you. Thank you. I see no one else, and we have um, expended our time. So I think that we will move on. So um, we'll go back to the council. Um, we have a, a motion and a second, um, and maybe yeah. Michael. Yeah, just Ben McDougall, the code enforcement officer, is here. And there's been lots of questions about what happens if the council approves this. Uh, what's conditional? I wonder if he might be the council be interested in hearing from from Ben yes, on if the council does approve this. What happens next? How does it evolve? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Good evening. <clears throat> there are four points of the conditional approval that require my oversight. Uh, they're security, maintenance, shock containment, and lead management. Uh, the security, maintenance, and shock containment for the 25-yard range will be confirmed and certified by Rick LaRosa. Uh, Rick has stated that he's willing to do this. Uh, in the off chance he's unable, uh, we will find another licensed professional who will uh, certify these three components of the conditional license. Uh, in the case of the 50 and 100 yard ranges, I will require that the designs be completed by licensed design professionals and uh, a licensed professional will also certify the final product uh, as constructed. Uh, my approval of the lead management plan will be based upon the recommendation of a licensed professional as well. Uh, most likely a certified geologist or professional engineer. And uh, that, that covers it. Thank you, Ben. If yeah. you'd stay there just for a moment. Sure. Do counselors have questions for Ben? Jim. Uh, the, um, frankly, at this point, I don't know what email I got about this because it's been coming at us fast and furious over the last several days. Um, you're in the code enforcement business. And when somebody uh, takes a building permit out, and they'll give you a dollar, dollar value, $100,000, there's often a discrepancy in how much money is spent to actually complete the project. And there may also be a difference in the design from as built. Could you explain the reason you're the check and balance in the midst of this so that people can understand and trust that we as a, as a town, as a municipality, have been doing this whole building thing for a very long time. And this is not the first rodeo for us to be looking at something that has some discrepancy in it. And Mr. Nato pointed it out. I think another person, um, I'm not sure when Norton pulled out 200,000 for Mr. LaRose. Can you explain that gap or that, that unknown, if you will, in how you as the check and balance manage that? Yeah, there, there has been some concern with the building permit. Uh, we have architectural plans. We have plans from a structural engineer. Uh, and then we have uh, Mr. Mayon's hand-drawn plans that all kind of come together in this design. Uh, I've been in contact with Mr. LaRosa. I've been in contact with the structural engineer. Uh, I am confident that we will get the product that gives us 100% shot containment uh, by, by working with the professionals. Uh, it is relatively common for architectural plans and structural plans to have minor discrepancies in building projects. It's, it's relatively common during a building project for uh, things to need to change on the plan. And you get the architect and the engineer involved, everybody agrees that the change is okay and the end result is the same uh, and and we move forward so it's it's a relatively common occurrence with building permits and then the two hundred thousand dollar number that somebody's referred to 
in Mr. LaRose's commentary and how there's some sort of, sort of you know, I guess call it a, a, um, a rush to judgment that the club is not spending 200000 and for some reason we're getting this done less than what was expected. I mean, can you comment on that? Because it's, it's, it's out there, and I just, you know, you're the professional. I don't recall Mr. LaRosa saying that. I, I don't doubt that he did. I, I don't recall the specific instance, uh, and, I, and I don't know how much it costs to construct what's going on there, but there, there oftentimes are discrepancies with uh, money on projects for several reasons. Uh, people come to me and, you know, say they're building a, a large addition on their house, but they've got, you know, all donated materials and all their friends and family are coming over to build it. So, you know, the addition only costs $500. Uh, so that, you know, there's, there's, there's several reasons why there can be discrepancies in the amount of money, but, you know, in this case, I can't speak specifically to it. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Other questions for Ben from councillors? Molly. I have a couple of quick questions. Ben, <clears throat> uh, my first one is about the lead management plan. I just pulled out the, uh, from the EPA, the Chapter 3 Best Management Practices for Outdoor Ranges. You would mentioned you'd find someone, uh, either a geologist or a PE, who would be able to assess the plan as a whole. Is that right? Yes. And. Um, do we have somebody that you know of in the state of Maine, or how would you go about finding that professional? And are you comfortable with that process? I, I am comfortable with that process. I, I think there's uh, many professionals that could do that. Not, not nearly as difficult as finding a range architect, hmm. uh, which is a, a relatively obscure profession. Uh, uh, there are uh, lots of certified geologists in the state of Maine, lots of professional engineers in the state of Maine who who study lead and groundwater issues. Great, thank you. Patty? I guess I just have a follow-up question to that. Um, Mark Mayone presented the environmental report from MAI, MAI Environmental, which is, they deal with compliance, hydrogeology, engineering, and permitting. And he found this report where they did, um, they did surface water testing um, at two different places, and it, it was not traceable, you know, by the time lead was not in the water, by the time it left. And there was emails, many of them that talked about, uh, and rightly so, um, worried about water that would leave there with the lead and affecting Richard Carson and everything else. I and mean, we have beautiful habitat here. Based on what you know at this point, and because there's construction going on um, prior to getting a certified report, do you feel that um, this environmental report is a, somewhat of a good indication about um, what's happening with the lead affecting the environment or not? Yeah, it's certainly a good, good indication and, and a good piece of information to have. I, I'm not a geochemist, so I can't, you know, speak professionally about the, about the specifics of it, but it seems like a good indication. Okay. Other questions for Ben? Jessica. I just want to clarify, we did discuss this at the public hearing, but if with a conditional license with 100% shot containment for the 25 yard range, to be clear, there will be absolutely no firing until you and the range safety expert, and I believe also with the police chief, certify that that is complete and contained. So there would be no live fire until that has happened. That's correct. And furthermore, the same thing will occur with a, at some point in the future with the 50-yard range and the 100-yard range, um, whatever yeah. there are, facilities. Yes. Yeah. So, so you are completely confident that that is how this will play out. Yes. Thank you. Caitlin, did you? Oh, no, I was just Molly. Had her hand up. Oh, Molly. I, I'm not sure if this is a question for Ben or maybe for the manager, but I did want to follow up on Mr. I think it's Mr. Romano's concern about the reimbursement for Mr. LaRosa's fees. Me. I'm sorry. What? That would be me. Thank you. Can you speak to that concern? Yes, I can. Uh, 
you know, early on, when, as this has evolved, there was a discussion at a council workshop on, on whether or not we would require the Rodney Dunn Club to pay uh, the fee for the licensing the inspectors. There was no formal decision, but there seemed to be a consensus that we that the council wanted the money to be put into safety improvements and not coming back to the town on fees. So at that point, there seemed to be a consensus that we would not pass along that cost to the Rod and Gun Club. But but there was, as, as Mr. Romano points out, there was never a formal vote. And you know, and ultimately, as the town treasurer, it's my responsibility to collect that fee. And I haven't sent a bill to the Sperwick Rod and Gun Club. And at this point, I don't intend to send a bill. Uh, to the right and club unless I received uh, further instruction. Thank you. Other questions? I have some other questions, yes. but not for Ben. For not for, thank you, Ben. Molly. Thank you. Um, unrelated, I think, to anything that we have talked about tonight, but related, I think, to the original recommendations from the firing range committee. I think we were asked to look at the weekend hours of operation. Have we, did, did we move on from that recommendation? Did we have a discussion about that? And is, this, is nobody following what I'm asking? I know it came up in the original recommendations, I think. Just to, did you want to respond? Well, to touch on it, some of the things we'd have to consider are why we would be changing the hours. And if you're changing the hours for noise issues, then you get into some legal problems with you can't regulate the noise from the gun club. If you're changing the hours for another <coughs> reason, then I'm not sure what other justified reason you could come up with changing hours on the weekends for safety or we, we would need to come up with something for a reason as to why those hours need to be changed other than noise. Mm. Okay. And, um, Jim? That I, I own that piece of the recommendation um, from the Fire Range Committee. And uh, the genesis of that is it came from the sound engineer that spent a couple, three hours with us one evening explaining the facts of life about sound and the explosion that comes from a gun and how the contours of the land deal with it and so forth and the fact that the atmospheric issues affect it as well. And one of the major issues that I heard him tell us in that three hour session, which by the way, I believe you guys paid for it, okay, uh, was that the gun club and the neighbors need to coexist and that some sensitivity needs to be added here and logic to that whole discussion. So. When the recommendation was made, I put that on there as a conversation. And frankly, you know, it, we can take it if, up if we want to or not, but it's not part of tonight's uh, Right, I saw it was not yeah, part of facts. tonight's discussion. But it was about coexistence. And, and again, it was a, a rather enlightening evening for anybody who sat through that session, because this guy can talk, but he certainly knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> I would just ask fellow councilors if anybody has an opinion about that, only because it came out of the recommendation out of the firing range committee. And what I heard back from Caitlin just now was that that did not sound like it was going to be something that was easily addressed because of the sound or the noise regulations or the fact that we don't want to tamper with or, or address that through this ordinance. Well, we're not a legally not allowed. Correct. I un not sorry. Allowed I understand that very yeah. clearly. Okay. I want to want to remind the council that the motion is to accept the findings of fact on block. The motion does not include the approval of the license. So, if in fact that we vote in the affirmative or the negative about the findings in fact on block, we then still have to address the license. It's separate. Um, so, just want to remind you folks, so, do you want to have additional discussions about the findings of fact before we vote no. on the findings of fact? No. 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 No? No. No. Okay. So, all in favor of the findings of fact. 
Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the license application of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club conditioned upon the final certifications being made by the code enforcement officer of each of the matters set forth above in the record of this application? Jim. So moved. Thank you. Second. Caitlin, thank you. Discussion, comments? Jessica. I have a, some prepared words that I'd, with the council's indulgence, I'd like to express. Absolutely. <clears throat> Getting to tonight has been a long process, and we've come a very long way. Since early 2013, the town council has worked hard with safety as a goal. Prior to 2013, no other town council has made any substantial effort to respond to citizen, citizens' concerns regarding the gun club. To date, since 2013, we have spent approximately $16,000 on legal fees. We wrote and ultimately approved the first ever shooting range ordinance for the town of Cape Elizabeth. In early 2014, the town council appointed the firing range committee, which began meeting to start the process of permit and license application review. None of this oversight would have been possible without the ordinance written in 2013 and approved in early 2014. Without that new law, we would have no authority whatsoever to affect a private club on its private property. Throughout the process, we have received complaints from both gun club supporters and concerned neighbors. Some felt we were going too far, some felt we were, haven't gone far enough. We very much appreciate the many emails and efforts and engagement on the part of all our citizens. Since 2013, the Town Council has made real efforts at real changes to enhance safety for all Cape Elizabeth citizens, and this had not been done before. The Gun Club has made and is making good faith efforts at compliance. A conditional license is just that, conditional. Gun Club and its range safety design architect are fully aware of the four expectations of compliance that are going to be held by the town of Cape Elizabeth. I have every confidence that our code enforcement officer and police chief will ensure full compliance with the town law and therefore I am supporting granting the Gun Club conditional licensure pending those four points of review. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Jim. Uh, I just want to point out something that's going on in, a, in, a, in the city that's closest to us tonight. Uh, the city of Portland is actually discussing short-term rentals. And they are using Cape Elizabeth as a best in class because we, in 2013, put an ordinance in place after Patty Grennan over here, who happens to be one of our members now, complained about the short-term rental next to her house eliminating and causing less than quiet enjoyment of her home. We took a lot of difficult discussions in lots of meetings. We heard good things and bad things. We're going too far. We're not going far enough. Very similar to the situation here. Here we are a couple of years later in the short-term rental situation in Cape Elizabeth is under control. It took a lot of guts, but it took a lot of hard work, and it took listening to the public. And I believe, and I've only got one more meeting as a town councilor after my six years, I believe that we're going to look back on this and say it was worth the hard work because I believe that we have gone head on into the safety issue and without that ordinance which took a lot of guts we wouldn't be here tonight and I want to tell you I appreciate the civility in tonight's discussion it has not always been like that and I've been accused in my six years, if I don't have thick skin, I ought to get out of the kitchen. I'm telling you, I really believe that when we look at this a year from now or two years from now, we're going to feel very good.
but this is a very receptive group. We'll have a new council, and if there are things that need to be improved or tweaked and made better, I believe that we have the wherewithal to do that. And we're a small enough community, and we care enough about each other that we'll, we, we will fix those things. So again, I thank you for the civility this evening, and I thank my peers for really doing something really incredible, which is to step in something in a place that nobody wanted to go for a very long time. One of my best friends was the chairman in 1997 of this town council, and they chose not to go there, not to go after any ordinance or in any way control. And this council had the guts to do it, and I applaud everyone, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else? No? No? I won't repeat what has been said, but I know that for myself, I've been working on this for four years, and um, it's been a real challenge. Um, you know, it's been a long, extensive process. Um, I appreciate the public input. We have people in the public who have been um, very engaged, engaged daily, multiple times daily, um, many times today. <laughs> um, and we have a, a gun club that has been um, really trying hard to work um, towards something that is acceptable. Um, I know that when the council really looked at this, and I know for me personally, it was about the safety. And I know that when we first started this and we were first talking about this, um, I don't own a gun. I don't know how to shoot a gun. Um, I don't think anybody wants me to have a gun. Um, and, and, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that I don't support people who are entitled to do that. And I do. Um, I support people who are entitled to do all kinds of things that I don't do, and that's fine. But I, I think that the council tried to really focus on the safety, which is why the council ordered the safety evaluation. Um, and that's important to remember, is the council ordered the safety evaluation. And it came back, and it said, we have to do some stuff. And uh, so we said, you know, let's take care of that. Let's get it done. And the, the club said, we're right there. And I, you know, I, I thought about this, and I thought, you know, that was a risk for the, for the gun club to take because they started doing those improvements not knowing if they were going to get that license. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a risk, and that's a hard thing to do. Um, at the same time, I, you know, I listened to the uh, neighbors, and I understood that they were concerned about safety. I don't blame them, you know. Um, the, the safety report said there's, there, there's potentially a problem. And, you know, so they, they um, gave their responses, and they looked at things, and they said, you know, we're concerned. We don't want to have any problems with our children and our dogs and taking a walk and so forth. And, um, but it's hard because I look around the room and I know that there are people in this room that are on, um, have major differences of opinion. But the council has to make a decision. And that's hard for us to do because we cannot possibly um, satisfy everybody in this room. We can't. But I think that we are trying, and I, I think the council's done a really good job at trying to say, you know, um, let's try to run it down the middle. That's what we did with the ordinance. Um, I think that's what we're trying to do with the, um, the licensing. And I don't think there's anybody on the council that doesn't care a lot about the town and what's best for the town. So um, I'm going to support this motion. Um, so um, anyway, I don't want to go on and on, but does anybody else have anything to say? No. OK. So I will say all in favor of the motion. And I will say also that I know there's a lot of people in the room that probably want to chit-chat and do some things, so I will take a three-minute recess.
and please um, find your way out so because we have a lot of other things to do. thank you Get back to our job here. Excellent. Glad to hear. Patty, do you see her? <coughs> Patty. Patty? You did. You did. No. I don't know where she is. Mm. Might be a lady. Patty went? Mm. Might be a lady. No, I just Oh, yeah, it was great. She was Okay. There she is. Okay, so we will move on now to the um, public hearing for the annual update of general assistance appendices. Is there anybody here to speak to us about that? Uh, I see nobody. So, close the public hearing. So then we'll move on to item 116, which is the annual update of the general assistance appendices. Uh, Mike, did you want to say anything about this? Yeah, it's recommended that you adopt the updated appendices. And what these appendices do is, is provide to the General Assistance Administrator the allowed amounts that we can provide uh, needy families for, for food, for housing, for shelter, uh, and, and other uh, utilities and other supplies. And the amounts are recommended by the Maine Department of Health and Human Services along with MMA and we traditionally have always adopted the recommended amounts. 
Questions? No. Is there a motion to accept? Molly. I move that we adopt the updated appendices. Thank you. Is Second. there a Second. Thank you. Questions? Comments? All in favor? Thank you. Um, before we move on to the public hearing for the land use amendments, I've asked Maureen to give us uh, just a sort of an overview. Um, so Maureen, if you would come up. This is sort of a, just the information, the facts, because I know if, if any of you read through the land use amendments this afternoon like I did, um, it looks extensive, but it maybe isn't as extensive as it looks. So thank you, Maureen. It is. Um, good evening. So I, I thought a little bit about how to get through 30 pages worth of amendments, and I decided I was just going to put it in context and, and leave you to do some um, questions. So where did these come from? They were referred from the council to the planning board. Uh, the origin of all of these amendments are the 2007 comprehensive plan and the recommendations from the FOSS committee. And, you know, there's been a lot of conversation and talk, and I think it, it's worth taking a moment to just make it clear that the comprehensive plan was a 10-member committee of town residents appointed by the town council. Uh, they conducted a statistically valid survey in 2005 by Critical Insights. They held 29 meetings. They held three public forums. They had 12 articles published in the Cape Courier describing each chapter of the comprehensive plan as it was drafted. The final plan was unanimously adopted by the town council. Had 91 recommendations. How do you get through 91 recommendations? Uh, you drop it into pieces. So uh, 33 were identified as high priority, which is what we need to do under state law. And we took those high priority recommendations, and again, in order to implement them in a reasonable fashion, put them into five packages. Uh, the first package that was done was the shoreland zoning update. It was required by the state. Uh, during that review, the town council briefly considered repealing the wetland regulations, but that didn't happen. Uh, the next was the business aid district overhaul. During that, the council had, I think it was six workshops. Um, it was very emotional, very controversial. They were adopted, and both VA districts are still surviving. Uh, agricultural amendments were adopted, and we still have farms. The subdivision ordinance was overhauled by the planning board, and the last package is this land use amendments package. So I do want to point out that of the 91 recommendations from the 2007 comprehensive plan, we got the recommendation to create the shore road path. Uh, we got a recommendation to preserve wetlands. We got a recommendation to prioritize preservation of agriculture. So the comprehensive plan is a very large document that's had a lot of impact, good, bad, whatever. So most of the land use amendments package comes out of that comprehensive plan, but some of it is much more recent. Uh, the Future Open Space Preservation Committee was a nine-member committee appointed by the town council, again, all residents of the town. The Future Open Space Preservation Committee held 30 meetings. They held a public forum. They came out with a report with 21 recommendations. So between the comp plan and the FOSS committee and a couple of little minor things, we have 15 recommendations that are represented in these 30 pages of ordinance and two maps. Uh, if you want a description of those 30 recommend, those recommendations and how each amendment has been crafted, I would refer everyone to the March 25th, 2015 memo from the planning board to the council because that breaks down every recommendation and what is the um, implementation step, which was ordinance amendments and maps. I'm happy to go through all of that. So I was trying to think about why do we care about all of this. Uh, the amendments are really proposing to expand the regulation of multiplex. We think multiplex is more of what we may see in the tiny amount of new development Cape Elizabeth is going to experience because the population of Cape Elizabeth is getting older, like the entire country is getting older. And we expect that people will want to stay in Cape Elizabeth. The people who live here love it here. We have very, very high satisfaction rates. And as they age in place, they're going to, some of them, are going to want to transition out of their single-family homes into housing that's more accommodating 
two seniors. And that means there's probably going to be a little bit more multiplex and a little less single family. Uh, the regulations that you have in front of you clean up our open space provisions. And we require that open space be donated. We require it be permanently protected. And I think the provisions you have in front of you do nothing but make them stronger. Uh, the other thing they do is they bring in the, the best work of the FOSS committee was to actually talk about what is the most important kind of open space in Cape Elizabeth. And their process in the end identified agricultural land as the number one priority for open space preservation, greenbelt as the number two priority, and wildlife habitat as the number three priority. So the existing open space requirements have been realigned to make those types of open space the highest priorities. And then I have the two maps, which I have to go over. So one of the, couple of the recommendations from the comp plan was to take away some of the barriers to connecting to public sewer. There's been a general consensus by the council and definitely a 100% consensus by the planning board that any development should connect to public sewer whenever available, it's more environmentally sound. However, the map right here, which you all see, all the shades of blue, are existing sewer service areas. If you own land in one of these blue areas, you can go to the public works director and ask for a sewer permit, and pay the sewer fee, and do the construction to connect to the sewer. If you're not in one of these blue areas, you can't, unless you're within so many feet. But our recommendations are that people that are in the business B district and in the residence B district should be connecting to sewer. We're not making it mandatory as the comprehensive plan recommended. But right now, if you want to develop in any of these yellow areas right here, which are RB districts, which we've said these are our potential growth areas, you have to come to the council. You have to have the council <coughs> designate you a sewer service area. Then you go back to the planning board and design your project. What we're talking about doing is amending the sewer service area map so that all these yellow areas turn blue. So that if you want to do something there, you then are one step closer to being able to connect to public <coughs> sewer. We have these two pink areas. These are the business B districts. Same thing. If we would turn these blue, so if, for example, one of the businesses in the business B district wanted to connect to the public sewer, they wouldn't have to come to the council and ask for permission. All of this is still contingent upon making sure that there's adequate capacity in the sewer system and following all the town's rules regarding connections. The other map we are changing is the transfer of development rights map. And this map is important because we do have a tool in our ordinance and that, that is supposed to help us preserve open space. And it's called the transfer of development rights. And it says that if I own property right here, and I don't want to develop my property, but I still would like to get a financial return on it, I can sell some of the potential development off of this land and transfer it someplace else. If I do that, I have to put a conservation easement over a portion of the property so it can never be developed. And this map exists right now. But again, we just talked about the FOSS Committee and how they realigned our open space priorities. So all the areas in yellow, this bright yellow, are the current TDR areas. Some of these areas really don't match up with our priorities for open space anymore. So the yellow with the red hatching are areas we're proposing to delete as transfer development rights area. Some of them don't make sense because they've been developed. Uh, some of them don't make sense because they no longer reflect our priorities or they've already been conserved as open space. And then we're proposing to add <coughs> some transfer development rights areas and when we went through the maps we had, what we found is there are agricultural lands that are showing up on the agricultural map that the FOSS committee developed that really should be designated as transfer development rights areas. So we developed this map, the planning board. We had a public forum where we sent mailed in, um, invitations to all the large lot owners, including all the people where the changes were. They came, it was actually a very good discussion, there was a couple of tweaks they wanted us to make, we made them. So that's what this map represents. Um, with that, I just want to make a point that the council, excuse me, the ordinance 
Ordinance Committee reviewed all 30 pages line by line by line, and I'm looking at two of the Ordinance Committee members there so they can attest what a good time they had. Um, and they made a recommendation, uh, three to zero, to recommend these amendments to the Council. They uh, made a few changes, and the changes they made are on, in the memo that's dated September 1st, 2015. It's a short list. I'm happy to go over it. Um, or you can go over it yourself. The only other thing you should be aware of is the proposed amendments include a brand new section uh, for design standards for multiplex development. We don't currently have any design standards. And the last time you saw this, uh, we had pictures, and we've been able to convert the pictures to line drawings. So the version you have in front of you tonight actually has the line drawings. So unless there's any questions, I, I have to stop. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Jim. Uh, because of all the discussion and the number of emails that we've received around this, I would like to have you go through that list and for the public who are at home, because there, some of them are not here, that are concerned about this because there were some controversial issues in what was originally out there and this has been cleaned up. And I think, Maureen, I, I go through the chair. Is, is that something no, you can do? Absolutely. I mean, that's why I talked with Maureen today, because I thought it was important yeah. for her to give the council the, um, you know, the information mm -hmm. that's just the direct information, and also that it's also being broadcast, so there are people at home that may be Good. watching. And I think it's important yeah. to deal with the facts. Yeah, because the Ordinance Committee did a great job right. of cleaning it up. Right, and if we have the facts in front of us, then we make decisions based on facts, and Sometimes those facts get a little blurred, blurred so yeah, that would be great if you wouldn't mind. Okay, so reading from the cover memo from the council, from the ordinance committee to the council, which is dated on or about September 1st of this year, um, the proposal to reduce the minimum lot size in the RA district for multiplex housing from 10 acres to 5 acres has been deleted. So the multiplex housing minimum lot size in the RA district remains 10 acres. Um, as a comp as a compatible item, the minimum lot size for multiplex housing in the RC district remains five acres. The, de the re proposal to reduce that to three has also been deleted. Uh, there are words in the open space zoning provisions that talk about changing setbacks for cluster development. The wording has been changed. The meaning is the same. That option is still available for the planning board. Uh, in the open space provisions that I talked about where they've been enhanced, there's a specific reference to Greenbelt Trails that has been added. Uh, text has been added that makes it clear in the design standards, the new design standards for multiplex housing, that when we talk about the front of the building being oriented to the right of way, it says front of building, not just the A building. Uh, the paragraph that talks about s exterior siding for multiplex development, actually it used to say a heading was exterior materials, now it's called exterior siding materials. The other change was that vinyl siding was listed as a siding material that was not allowed and that has now been taken off that list so vinyl siding could now be allowed. Uh, and then the provision allowing a building to go up to 50 feet in height because the current height limit is 35 feet if you preserved more open space than you were required to has also been eliminated so the height stays at 35 as the maximum. And then there was a proposal to allow some bonus provisions and the maximum bonus allowed was proposed to be 30 percent and the language making it clear that that is the maximum has also been strengthened. Thank you, and I will just uh, note that that <coughs> memorandum was dated August 28th, 2015, so if anybody's looking for that or if folks are looking for it from, you know, um, home, it's August 28th, and I assume it's on the web? Yes. It's on the web, so thank you. Sure. Any questions for Maureen? Yes. I just would, um, would like you to just briefly um, mention that we did enhance TDR uh, to transfer development rights for ag agricultural property. Yes, the, and that's another recommendation from the comprehensive plan. Um, when we <coughs> talked about the TDR concept, if you were here, you were transferring TDR, you, you could build one house on 80,000 square feet, so you'd say that 80,000 square feet of land area could transfer one development right. We provided a bonus in the marketplace for agricultural land. 
So where you could transfer one development right for regular property, if it's agricultural land that you're transferring it off of. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Maureen? Um, the notification process that you used for this? The ordinance is all text amendments except for the maps and the maps we publish the maps in the legal ad as well as a legal ad that talks about the text amendments. There was no mailing to the property owners as part of this meeting, but we did mail to the property owners as part of that original public forum. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Patty. I guess I have one comment and then a quick question. My comment would be, um, I just want to comment with the Ordinance Committee. I think um, on making these changes, when we began this process, there was a feeling that I heard from um, people coming to speak on it that they felt like if it went to the Ordinance Committee, basically at that point, it's pretty much whatever's presented is a done deal. And um, that didn't happen at all. So um, I think what, what I want to say is that you listened to what people said. They really didn't, they want, didn't want the lot changes you know, from 10 to 5 and 5 to 3 respectively in the RA and RC districts. They didn't want the 50-foot fight. And you guys went in and you, you took it out. So um, I think it's just an example of being re uh, the, this council being responsive to what they're hearing. Um, my quick question would be, um, why did you add final siding back in? I'm just curious. Well, if you think about condominiums, yep. a lot of people are looking for low maintenance when they purchase a condominium. All of the Eastman Meadows condominiums are vinyl. OK. And they look good. OK. Mm. And I'm glad you brought that up, Patty, because you know, having been on the ordinance committee for a number of years, yeah. um, it's never a rubber stamp. I mean, we just tear the things apart and we go over line by line and we change, change a lot of things. And I'm right. afraid the poor planning board isn't always necessarily happy with us, but I know they do the same thing. They tear things apart yeah, line true. by line. So it's really good when you have a lot of different people coming at it from a lot of different right. directions and looking at it because then when you, you know your final product is really looked at you know heavily so yeah anyway it, uh, Jim yeah the other point is it, it's good that Maureen gave some context at the beginning of her presentation because we've also heard from the public that it appears that the planner is moving this on her own for some reason it's her agenda and it's you know, it's coming from the comprehensive plan. Now, granted, 2007, and, you know, maybe it's time to come back in and dust it off and consider the next round, but the context that Maureen provides is important because there's a process. And those 10 individuals who spent all that time and the work that they did, it's, it's important for us to continue the process of continuing to look at it. And things change in, change in five years or 10 years or whatever. Long and short of it is that, that that context is important because, you know, Maureen is really, she's really doing the work of the town, not the work of Maureen. Um, even though she's a talented person who has a great insight into how things happen, uh, I just want people to understand that, that you know, we've, we've gotten some push along that line and I want to make sure that the record is straight. Jessica. Yep, I, I'd like to add to that sentiment because um, there there has been criticism in that direction. But I think it's it's well to be reminded that the comprehensive plan is has to be managed according to state law, and the the recommend, recommendations and um, that are in a, a comprehensive plan have to be shown to have been considered, followed, altered, whatever. You don't just write a comprehensive plan and leave it there because you decide later, well, I, I just don't want to go there. You, you have to um, make every good faith effort to uh, implement um, that document. And so I think what a lot of people don't understand is that that is part of the job of the town planner to make sure that the town is compliant with state law with comprehensive plans. And I'd also like to um, thank the planning board because this was a massive <laughs> undertaking. And, and in fairness, they would have been 
at this a lot earlier, as in several years earlier, had it not been for the forestallment of that because of the interest in uh, having a future open space committee, right. which put all of that progress mm -hmm. on hold. Right. So yeah. we've had a lot, of, and we've had a lot of complaints that this comprehensive plan is, you know, too old. Well, you know, eventually it will be, of course. But I, I like to remember that it would have been trucking along as mm -hmm. the schedule it was supposed to had it not been forestalled for several years for other interests. So, um, but at any rate, also, it, it's a huge amendment, and the planning board spent hmm. months and months on this. And um, they, they certainly made the, the ordinance committee's job a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank the planning board. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else for Maureen? Molly. I don't have anything for Maureen. I just want to make it general comment as well. And actually, I don't know Victoria Valent. I've only met her once as we were doing a site walk on the library project. But I did notice she had a very nice letter in the courier today. I'm just going to quote a couple of things that she says in here because, again, I think it's really important to acknowledge the hard work of the planning board and the ordinance committee that's done such good work. And she summed this up very, very nicely. With these amendments, we end up with permanent legal protection and preservation of open space, agricultural lands, and sensitive environmental areas from development. We end up with diversified housing options to allow people to age in place and remain in Cape Elizabeth near friends and family. And we end up with <coughs> implementation of site design standards emphasizing visual appeal, landscaping, and arch architectural compatibility with the character of the community. I thought that was very nicely summed up. I really do appreciate the hard work of the planning board in particular. Um, I'll just say I'm prepared to vote. I don't, well, thank I don't you. know if we're quite there yet. But no, we're not quite there. Um, I will tell you that we need to move on to the public hearing about this, so I will open the public hearing if anybody wants to speak to us about that. Same rules, come up to the uh, podium, give your name and address, and you have three minutes. Anybody want to speak to us about the land use amendments? I'm not seeing anybody. So, close the public hearing. Um, so we will move on to the proposed land use amendments and updated sewer service area map and transfer of development rights. Um, is there a motion to accept? Uh, Jessica. Uh, I move that we accept the proposed land use amendments and updated sewer service area map and transfer of development rights. Thank map. you. Is, is there a second? I'll Holly? second that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Discussion? Comments? No? Are we ready to vote? All in favor? Thank you. And thank you, Maureen, and thank you, Planning Board. Okay, uh, we will move on then to item 118, which is the Village Green Zoning Amendment proposal. And um, the Planning Board, again, has done a lot of work and is rep recommending to amend the zoning ordinance related to Village Greens, and it's recommended that the proposal be referred to the Ordinance Committee. Is there a motion? Yeah, Peter, I'm sorry. Would you like to speak to this? That would be lovely. Yes, we always enjoy all the information we can get. Uh, thank you. I'm Peter Curry, Chair of the Planning Board. Um, in May, you referred to as a proposal to really tweak the front setback requirements in the Town Center Zoning District, <coughs> excuse me, to permit a uh, Village Green to be constructed in conjunction with development around the Village Green. Uh, the catalyst was, for this was a proposal on the parcel just to the south of Town Hall. Um, and the, the reason for this is, as I'm sure you know, is that the, the town center zoning district, which is quite small, attempts to bring all the development to the front of the street. So there is a minimum maximum front setback that would really interfere with the putting a village green in that would connect to the, to the roadway. Um, so we, we went at it, we had a couple of things in mind. One is that we did not want to write a proposed change of the ordinance that was site specific. This parcel next door was 
obviously an example of how it might work, but we, we intended to go m more broadly. Uh, we also went a little bit beyond the idea of just saying, well, if there's Village Green, we can fiddle with the setbacks to make it possible. We felt that was a little bit too, too vague in general. And so what uh, we came up with was the uh, concept of a site plan approval for a development that included a Village Green. And that's, that's kind of how it's being looked at. Uh, we tr took the opportunity to put design criteria for the village green itself in the ordinance. <coughs> you know, village greens are a traditional part of New England life going back to the 17th century, but they come in all sizes and shapes, and we thought it was important to be able to have some control over a village green that would be compatible with Cape Elizabeth and meet the goals of the town and uh, the town government. So that's basically what you have uh, before you. It's, um, this is really, it's, it's, it's a dimensional uh, change in the ordinance. It changes the front yard setback and it creates criteria for the village green. It has to front on Ocean House Road. It has to be, at least has dimensional requirements of frontage, depth, and width. Um, and that's, that is about it. Um, the other thing I think is important to remember is that all of these parcels here in town, in, the, in the, the zoning district, can be developed at any time with whatever the zoning permits. And this is a hybrid zoning district of both commercial and residential, typically multiplex, um, units. So this is, this is a, a, a little bit unusual, and anybody who owns the land and who meets the recipe of the zoning ordinance and the site plan requirements can do what they want. Um, and this, is, this isn't some libertarian happy talk. It's, this is basic American Civics 101. You own the land, you're entitled, you're entitled to do what you want. But we thought it would be useful to make it possible for a developer who wanted to include a village green in the development because it would improve the quality of their venue and that would confer a benefit on the town. So this, this is really a public-private um, partnership if it ever happens. There is no saying that it will happen. There has to be somebody who's willing to do it and go along with this proposal. But if somebody wants to, then we think it's important to make it possible, and that's what this amendment uh, seeks to do. Thank you, Thank Peter. You. Any questions for Peter? Thank you very much. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, Jessica. Yeah, I, I just had one. Um, the, um, I just would like you to just reiterate that this is voluntary. In other words, a developer can do this if he chooses to. Absolutely. <clears throat> and that the, could you just elaborate briefly on the, um, the transfer of the green space to the town, how that works, um, and how, you know, how that's proposed. I mean, I've read it, but I think it's worth hearing you tell the audience here and at home. Yeah, this, and this got a little bit complicated. We were very focused on the green itself and who would own it, who would control it, uh, who would have not only the design control, but the maintenance and use control. <clears throat> and we, were, uh, we approached this initially on requiring that it be conveyed in fee to the town and pre-approved by the council so that it, it would be a project that they wanted to accept. And town council advised against that for a variety of reasons described in the memo. And so the way it now sits, the, uh, it is not absolutely required, Marine, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the, the title to the green itself be conveyed in fee to the town, but there has to be a dedicated public right to use the green. And it's left somewhat open as to who will actually own the fee interest in the land. But it must be available to the public for public use as a town green, and it must meet the design requirements uh, that the ordinance requires. But you're absolutely right, Jessica. A, a developer uh, can say, I'd like to do this, or I really am not interested in doing this. I'm going to develop it the old-fashioned way without the green, and that's fine too. This is not some kind of a planning tool that we're using to try to assure that we'll have a village green. It's creating the possibility for it if a developer wants to, to have it. Yeah, this, this does nothing to promote development. It does nothing to discourage development. No, the, just the, an option. 
It doesn't, it it doesn't affect the use provisions of the zoning at all. I mean, whether it's businesses or multiplex housing or restaurants or shops, uh, it, it's whatever the, the person who's putting up the capital fields will be a, a productive use of the land. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have the proposal in front of us. Um, is there a motion to send this proposal to the Ordinance Committee for additional dissemination? <laughs> Jessica? Am I allowed as a member of the Ordinance Committee? Send it to yourself. Send, send it, it to, to yourself. To yes. ourselves. Yes. Two of us here. I move that um, the Village Green Zoning Amendment proposal uh, is, is uh, <coughs> referred to the Ordinance Committee. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jim. Discussion? All in favor? All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next is the report from the Ordinance Committee on the Special Events Ordinance. Um, does one of the ordinance folks want to take this on? Jessica, you want to? Sure. All right. We'll okay. See. Caitlin was giving you the handoff. I just go for it. Handed it off. This is a this is a big ordinance night. Mm, yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, yes, um, the special event facility zoning ordinance amendment. Um, let me just read a little bit. You've, we've all got a memo. I'll read a little bit of it, and I'll just mention a few highlights, and then perhaps um, if anyone would like to ask questions of. Uh, the town planner, we could. Um, the catalyst for the proposed amendments are the events currently held at the Wentworth Lodge, this is in the Sprague property, located in the RA district. Amendments are proposed to reconcile this activity with the zoning ordinance and to treat similar properties equitably. The proposed amendments create a special event facility overlay district in which special event <laughs> facilities are a permitted use a definition of a special event facility has been created which regulates large events where the property owner is compensated for hosting the event. That's a key piece. This is essentially a business activity. Special event facilities require a minimum of 15 acres held in contiguous common ownership and must comply with proposed performance standards. Highlights of the performance standards are a limit of 12 events per year, restriction on amplified music to no later than 10 p.m., and a requirement that site plan approval must be renewed every three years. So those are the, the highlights. Um, they, they also include a maximum of 275 people at the event, and that includes staff. And uh, each special event overlay facility district permit would have to be approved individually by the town council. And I would like to take this opportunity to um, again thank the planning board because this was, um, uh, they spent a lot of time on this. This is very different. And they worked hard to make this equitable uh, so that anybody who had, has 15 acres or more and wanted to partake of this in a business fashion as, as in they're being paid for this. Um, so, that this, so that this would be equitable. Um, and um, the Ordinance Committee, you know, spent a fair amount of time reviewing all this, but the Planning Board, again, came up with this, and I think they did. They did a, a very um, thorough job, but I think also a very sensitive job. <coughs> so I don't know if, if uh, Councilor Jordan would like to add to that, but we, we dissected it, as we do. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, would Public hearing on November 4th. Yes, I was going to ask, um, do we need to vote on that? Yes. So is there a motion to send this to a public hearing for November 4th? I want to make that. So moved. Thank you, Caitlin. I'll second. Thank Thanks. you, Jessica. Any discussion? All in favor? OK, great. Item 120, review of boards and commissions ordinance. Um, uh, so, as a result of a discussion at a town council workshop, it is re recommended to review the ordinance committee, to request the ordinance committee to review the boards and commissions ordinance for a general review and updating. So, I'm looking for a motion to send this to ordinance <coughs> because it would be a change in the ordinance as to some of the items. Caitlin. 
Molly. Molly. You're the other one. So moved. And Thank I'll you. Say, as the chair of the appointments committee, I would like to make that motion. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning you're not looking Second for work. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, any discussion? All in favor? <clears throat> Right. Um, item 121, updated pavement management plan, and I believe poor Bob Malley has been sitting through this for the last two hours. <coughs> Bob, would you like to come up and give us an update? Oh, there he is. I know. I couldn't see him either. And thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Chairman Ray. Um, in your packet is a proposed update of a, a five-year roadway and drainage priorities plan that was first done in 2013. And you should also have a narrative that accompanies that and a very lengthy Excel spreadsheet which talks about when every road was last paved and the treatment and what have you. So uh, the, the plan uh, uh, that you had, the first plan that was approved in 2013, uh, was based on our pavement management plan. And it's sort of a, a lengthy uh, document that uh, provides pavement uh, condition ratings, or PCRs as we call them, from a scale of zero to five on all of our public roads. And it also listed treatment estimates for those particular roads uh, to give us some guidance on budgeting. Um, the plan has been very, very helpful as we develop the proposal before you. Uh, it's been helpful if citizens call and want to know when is our road going to be paved, where do we stand in, in the queue, and we can actually give them a condition rating. The plan actually gave or provided a forecasted PCR rating for 2016 because, as we know, our pavement deteriorates over time, some more than others. So it's been very helpful to explain to citizens where their road is. Um, most of these are local road questions, uh, neighborhood street questions, but uh, and some folks have asked for a copy of the plan to look at it. Uh, uh, if they were given a rating of 3.5, and I'm you know, trying to tell them that you know we're working on the twos at this point, and we have you know pretty much followed our plan that was laid out, and uh, some of it's a sort of a work in progress. If there are utility upgrades, if roads deteriorate faster than others, you might uh, recall a section of Mitchell Road really deteriorated this past winter. A section of Shore Road. Uh, so some of these get accelerated given the weather conditions and we have to change things and, and mix things up a little bit. But it's been a good plan. Uh, in, in the plan that was adopted in 2013, we've followed that uh, guidance document. We've done some work, uh, made some good progress on sections of Spurwink Avenue, Sawyer Road between Eastman and Fickett, Charles E. Jordan Road, Old Ocean House Road, and Fowler Road. Those were all programmed in that 2013 five-year document. And we've also done some local roads uh, based on plan recommendations. We did some paving in Sherwood Forest on Friar Lane and Loxa Lane and uh, some other local streets. Um, as I said in the memo, the paving process is not inexpensive. Um, you know, it costs approximately $114,000 to pave a typical residential street that's 22 feet wide. And when you have a paving budget that includes uh, drainage improvements for, you know, $400,000, you can do the math and realize that it doesn't go that far. But we try to, uh, you know, make, you know, excellent use of those dollars and spread them as wisely as we can. We do different thicknesses on local streets versus collector roads. Uh, but we've, we've tried to balance that paving between maintaining our collector road network which carries the majority of our traffic, but also do some, you know, pay attention to some of our local neighborhood streets where people see sort of that direct benefit. Um, so, you know, I think we're making good progress. Uh, some of these roads that are before you, uh, such as Scott Dyer Road and Shore Road, they're not simple <coughs> overlay projects. Um, Mike and I have discussed several times Scott Dyer. Scott Dyer is probably our third busiest road between Route 77 and Shore Road. It's a major connector from the neighborhoods of the shorefront to the recycling center, the school campus, uh, and that includes Hill Way. Uh, so we need to really look comprehensively. You know, the latest term that people are using are complete streets, where you're not just looking at the pavement, but you're looking at sidewalks, drainage, um, and whether it's lighting, just to make sure when you look at this, this is an important connection for us. We need to make sure that we look at all of those aspects. So, the, the number that's budgeted here is a rough budget. 
Uh, the scope needs to be determined. It's proposed in the fiscal 2017 budget that we do preliminary engineering and develop that scope and to turn, you know, fine tune that cost estimate. But there are some drainage issues. There are some sidewalk issues on Scott Dyer. And uh, the good thing is that all of the utility upgrades uh, have been done. The water main, you probably all experienced traveling through there. There was three years of water main construction. That's now done. Um, so that was a, we want to make sure the utility upgrades are done before we tackle any uh, pavement improvements. Which leads us to Shore Road, which is another road, as you know, down in the Oakhurst area. We've received, you know, complaints about the pavement condition there this year. It took a real beating last winter. Um, it, it needs to be paved. There's some drainage issues across uh, from Mountain View Park with some antiquated drainage infrastructure or old or aging. But the water district wants to replace the water main there. And they would like to replace the water main starting in 2018. And in two phases, eventually they'd like to do all of Shore Road. The water main was put in in the 1930s. Hasn't been a big history of leaks, but uh, you know we want to make sure if we pave that road and put the investment in it, we don't want it dug up in five years. We don't want it dug up in 10 years. And once we make that investment, it's never really the same once it, it's opened up. So we're trying to work with them, but we are going to be doing a, th a very thin maintenance overlay down there, uh, hopefully next Wednesday, uh, if the weather permits, and uh, scheduling stays as it is, to just do a very, very, very thin layer of pavement between Cragmore, Birch Knolls area, and Stony Brook, just in that section where it's very, very rough. It's going to minimize the amount of time that we have to spend patching in the spring. It's going to scrape better when we plow it this winter. We'll be able to spend less time uh, plowing and using less salt in that area to try to clear the pavement. And then in, in subsequent years, we're doing some work on Eastman Road, Pheasanton Road, Broad Cove, uh, section of Mitchell that wasn't done this past year. And uh, moving on to a section of 77 from Fowler Road to the Scarborough Line, which you might think is state owned, uh, but it's actually under town jurisdiction now and Oakhurst and Woodland. So I did mention uh, in my narrative that the state has a program that uh, has a cost sharing component, which I think we need to look into. Um, doesn't involve a lot of heavy engineering. Uh, we provide a proposal to them, a cost estimate, and they will match the dollars. Uh, we have to match uh, their 50%. <clears throat> so I think that's a program worth pursuing, which help, might help offset some of these costs moving down the road. So. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on anything that's pending right now or anything that's proposed. Any questions for Bob? I have Molly. a question. Um, a couple of comments first. Number one, I think I said this last month or the month before, the work that you guys have done this summer looks terrific. Thank, Thank you. you. Love that we have a long-term plan and that we've updated it. Thank mm -hmm. you. And I just have one question on the proposed work on Scott Dyer Road, because I live on the other side of town, so I come on Scott Dyer Road regularly. And I think it was two summers ago, the water district put in a new water main all the way along Scott Dyer Road. It took all summer. Right. It took forever. So my question for you is, um, what I've noticed on your paving projects this year is that they're surprisingly quick. You're in, you're out. I think Mitchell Road was done in one day, mm -hmm. isn't that right? Mm -hmm. So would that be the case on Scott Dyer as well, or is this a much more extensive project? And if so, is it a day or two, or is it two weeks? Scott Dyer could be more than one day, uh, depending on what we have to do for drainage improvements, uh, the condition of the sidewalks, for example, below Longfellow Drive. Yes. That would take some time to rebuild those. I mean, this could be, you know, a four to six week project. Wow. We haven't wow. got that far with the scope, but depending on the extent of the drainage work we need to do, or if we add sidewalks down in the starboard drive area, it could add to the length of the project. So the paving projects generally move pretty quickly because you're mm. just doing a shimming or a leveling and then a, a resurfacing. Right. But anytime you're excavating and doing subsurface work, it could take some more time. So that would be another long summer. We'll it look could, forward to the it end could of that be. <laughs> Thank you. Michael. you know, there's a, I don't think Bob used the concept, but there's a, in planning, there's a, in road construction, there, there is something called complete streets. Yes. Yeah. And you, you look at the complete street, you look at the tree, I don't think you mentioned trees. I did not, know. No, you look at the trees, you look, you look at everything. And that, that's what Scott Dyer needs is, is to look, you know, complete, how does it work for pedestrians? How does it work for drivers? 
how does it work environmentally? And you know, it's a real opportunity for an important street in the community to, to do it right. And uh, you know, just today, a citizen stopped me in the parking lot, saying doesn't like the sidewalks there, doesn't feel as though they're adequate. You know, so there's a lot of opinions. Mm. No, I understand that, and by the way, I, I, all joking aside, we will look forward to the end of that project, not only because it will have been a long four to six weeks, but I agree that complete streets idea is the way to go, and, exactly. and you're looking at it for the long term. Exactly. Thank it's going to be disruptive when it happens. It's not going to be a one-day job. It's not a one-day job. That was no. it. Yeah. Maybe the library parking lot one day, but not that. <laughs> or the high school parking lot. Thank you very much, Bob. Right, you're Anybody welcome. Else? Jim. Just a question. Uh, Bob and I have had these conversations about different approaches to, uh, to uh, paving. And there are some less expensive approaches uh, to especially those feeder or, or the sort of the streets that have less um, traffic. And we discussed that um, uh, last summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in order to, you know, sort of spread the dollars out and get more done, but uh, you've had some experience with that, so if you could explain that it's a, this is, a, this is a, a tar that is put down on, on a road, and then the, the sand or the gravel is brought in on it, and then over time, the traffic is what seals it and finishes it. Now, his experience with that has is, is been an interesting one for me, because in some towns, that's all they do. Well, I, you know, I think South Portland, well, South Portland tried it probably about 20 years ago and really met with a lot of public resistance. It was, some of you might hear of chip sealing where, you know, a layer of asphalt is put down then maybe a fine layer <coughs> of stone. That's really not happening a lot in this area. Mm -hmm. um, again, South Portland tried it. They ended up repaving over some of the roads that they did. Scarborough, I believe, has tried some, some type of treatment that resembles that, but I'm not sure what the public reaction is to it. It may or may not be friendly to skateboards and the little bicycles and mm -hmm. those things. But it is a way of, with a different treatment that's a cheaper alternative, depending on the yeah. traffic that the road, you know, mm -hmm. carries. So is it worth looking at? It definitely is. Uh, it's, but it's a way of spreading those dollars further. Yeah. Well, that's all. I'm looking at the, the fixed dollars that we're spending on this. As you said, it's an expensive proposition, but maintaining our roads is one of the primary municipal functions. As we've heard from Town of Cumberland, is no longer going to service part of Wyndham because they haven't been taking care of their roads. Right. Um, and we certainly don't want to get ourselves in that situation. But anyway, I, again, encourage you to look at the option. Uh, again, I do understand the politics of it in terms of some people would not accept it because it's so different. Mm -hmm. But if there's a way to take our dollars and get more for it, especially on these roads that are less traveled, that are old and need to be resurfaced. That's, that was my only reason for bringing it up. Any other <clears throat> questions for Bob? No? Then I will look for a um, motion to acknowledge receipt of the plan. So yeah. moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Patty, thank you. Any more discussion? No? All in favor? All right. thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, then we will move on to item 122, which is update of pay classification plan, um, which is in your packet. Mike, did you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, very briefly. Uh, th this is simply an annual update. It's uh, Last year, there was a much more extensive update done. We, we changed the communities that we looked at for comparisons. For instance, substituting Standish for Scarborough. Uh, and as a result, you know, last year there were a lot of changes. This year, just looking at it, recommending that we adjust the, each of the numbers by the 2.5%, which was the same amount that was pro provided in the budget uh, for wage adjustments. There, no other changes. Thank you. Is there a motion to accept? Jessica? I right, so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Patty? Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Gee, we all look a little tired. Okay, item 123, which is the 2015 Council Goals an Kath, update. Kath, just a quick one. Yes, sir. As you hire a new library director, is this a, this is a document that is useful yeah. in? Good. Through the chair, that was, that's a good question. When we advertise the salary scale for the position, this document was the key reference point. Good, thank you. The practical use of it, that's... Mm -hmm. okay. 
Thank you. Um, so item 123 is the update on the goals, on the progress, and that's in your packet. Does anybody have any questions um, <coughs> for the council or for Mike about those? Great. Then I'll move on to item 124, which is the appointments committee report. <coughs> um, Holly, did you want to tell us about that? Sure. I'll say that the uh, appointment, appointments committee interviewed Mr. Crayford. Um, he is highly qualified, enthusiastic about the opportunity to serve. <coughs> We're recommending that he be appointed to fill the vacancy on the ZBA through 12-31-2016. Is that a motion? If I can make it, I will. Yes. So moved. Thank you. Patty? I'll second that. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Discussion? Question? Pretty good when the committees themselves are, are making the motion and seconding it. <laughs> That's why I asked. Pretty, pretty, pretty productive. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Then all in favor? Great. <coughs> um, item 125, uh, request from Councillor Walsh. Well, um, you know, I thought I would bring this to people's attention. Um, again, I'm, I don't have any, uh, no illusions of, of what can or can't or could take place with this, but as you go to your goal setting in the next several months, it may be a possibility for you to take a look at this. Not unlike the comprehensive plan, one has to take and look at what we've done and why we've done it, and when it's this five years between when we last looked at this, um, it's important to just understand how things have changed, okay? So just as a, a matter of backdrop for you, that um, in 2010, it cost $158,000 to run the park. And we collected $28,000 in, in, uh, in, in, in revenue at that time. This year, it's going to cost us $224,000, actually two fifty-five, dollars if you include the $30,000 that's been carried forward to do some stone wall work. And we are now uh, generating $182,000 in revenue in the park. And that's really a combination of things. It's the buses, it's the trolleys, it's also the rentals at the, all the uh, offices, quarters, and so forth. It's increased fees for the picnic shelter and some of those things. Um, so it's been uh, a, a good five years in terms of the, the, the way we've gone about our um, responsibilities in the park. Five years ago, we um, actually in 2009, um, uh, GCOG, which is uh, you know the Greater Portland uh, Area Governments, looked at um, some of the traffic in the park and actually came up with some numbers in 2009 from June, July, August, and September that weather dependent, you had anywhere you know from 900 to 1,100 cars a day during the busy, busy time at the park. So if you did the math, 120 days, a mil, you know, 1,000 cars, you're talking a million two um, in terms of traffic. We have exactly 350 parking spaces in this park, 350 legitimate parking spaces. We have overflow where the fire station is that we sometimes use on weekends because it's that busy. Um, and um, pay and display back five years ago when it was talked about, um, it wasn't quite the technology it is today. It, it wasn't, it was fairly new, a real outlier, if you will, in the minds of most people who were looking at it. But we did go to a referendum at that time. I was on the town council at the time, and I was the dissenting vote to go to a referendum. I didn't think it was necessary. I believe when you look at the survey that just came through and some of the feelings about the Goddard Mansion and what should happen, it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of dollars there that needed to be considered. We're talking about building an amphitheater or a gathering place, which is kind of a new word that we're using to describe it. Could be half a million dollars. We're constantly hearing we need bathrooms. Some of the numbers that we're floating, quarter of a million bucks. Talking about other things needed in the park, better sidewalk access, okay, for, especially for handicapped accessibility, especially if we go and build an amphitheater, we're going to have to be cognizant of that. We had recent dialogue with us, I know that Jessica brought it to us, what the, the issue of how wide the road is, where the, where the lobster concession is located. 
big dollars to expand that or widen it. So when you look at those types of things that p people want, invested infrastructure, there's a lot of money on the table. And, you know, I'm out of here, one more meeting. Um, I don't think the taxpayer should be burdened with all that. Um, and I believe that one of the opportunities is for us to do some, a passive pay and display process. Passive. I mean, it's, you know, the average person, according to that report in 2009, spends about an hour to two hours in the park. So even if you were conservative and said it was one hour, and you had those million cars, and even if you took half of that at 500,000 in one hour, you could be talking about some serious dollars that could be generated in this park in a passive way that's not going to prevent the family with five kids in Portland coming out and spending the day on the beach or at the picnic area or in our brand new um, swing set. The fact of the matter is we have an asset that I believe we need to care for and invest properly going forward. But with all of the m many different things that have been discussed, there's a lot of dollars expected. And I just look at this as an opportunity, whether you guys as the next council wish to take it is the decision you ultimately have. But I believe it's something we ought to dust off and look at and at least give it the daylight that it requires. And, you know, I, I will tell you that today, I mean, we got, we got one letter today telling us we ought not to do this, which is kind of interesting because that same person's running for town council. And all of the letters in the courier say this person's open to new ideas. Well, I'm dusting off an old idea that's now a new idea because the technology for this is different today. And just look at what's going on in Portland in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the downtown. So it's an interesting option. You know, the numbers could be uh, pretty positive in an, in, from a revenue generating standpoint for the investment in the park. It could also help <clears throat> taxes. But I'm just saying that to just avoid it, um, I don't think is, is, is doing our fiduciary responsibility is looking at options down the road and other ways to ge generate cash that will help us be the kind of community that we want to be. So that's my pitch. So, and Jim, um, <clears throat> your, ask, ask, your request is for staff to do the research on current technologies available, survey peer parks like ours, prepare, prepare a pro forma projection of potential revenues and report back to the town council, whether it's November or whatever, for consideration, maybe it's November, December, whatever. Yep. So um, I guess the question is, um, what is, you know, what is the wish of the other councilors? What do people want to see? Molly. I support this, and I'd also like to ask <clears throat> if we could follow up, just follow up on something you brought up earlier, I think, Jim, which was that you mentioned there are 20 or 30 or 40 buses coming through the park, and I walk there almost every single day. I, I see them. There are tons of people coming off those mm -hmm. buses. And I know we do charge a fee for them. It's $33,000. How much? much? 33000 is what we've collected. And I guess my question is, is it worthwhile revisiting that fee as well if we do this as a package mm -hmm. and just look at fees it, it is, and if you are charging for the park? It, and you weren't on the council when a lot of this discussion was taking place, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, that, that there was a lot of talk with the bus community that if we had bathrooms, we certainly would be in a very different place in terms of what we would charge or could charge. And one of the concerns that the whole bathroom issue brings, and Bob is, a, is, is our voice of reason, that just to build them and just build them isn't really all about bathrooms. There's a lot that goes with the maintenance of them mm -hmm. and some of the things that happen <clears throat> in bathrooms, so the ranger part of managing the park changes a bit. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's certainly an option, and certainly the Fort Williams Advisory Commission can take the, the bus piece up, I'm sure, as an advisory piece, but clearly if it were bundled all together, that'd be great. But at the same token, I, I just don't want to assume that there is there's an appetite, if you will, to open this up, since we had two referendums, 
frankly, I don't think we needed to be at referendum, but that's me. Um, and I think at this point, you know, it could, be, it could be an action plan for next year as part of your targeted goals. And what I included as my little statement about the steps that would be required would be the action plan that you would, you would affect. Right. And I don't want to rush it, but I also feel very strongly that, uh, that I wanted to at least get this out there on the table. Other oh, Mike? I just have a question for the chair for Jim. You know, happy to work on this with Bob and, and others to, to put it together. You know, the November council meeting is on the 4th of November. It's not in the usual time frame. And the, the way this is worded, I'm hearing, you know, that it's, it's being rushed before the election and there's discomfort with it. You know, this is something that, you know, probably would take some time, particularly if we look at other revenues and whatever. Does it make a big difference if that part the, the specific date, could that be changed? Oh, ab absolutely. I, 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 would like this, I would like this to get the full vetting that it requires. Okay, I don't want to rush it and I don't want to lose it on, on a technicality or a political reason. My concern here is that it was five years ago and a lot's happened and we're being asked to do even more. And I just think that, you know, as a, as a, as a, a group of people looking at the future, you should be looking at this. So I'm okay with dropping the November date, believe me. I, I had no idea whether, you know, this would even fly to this point, so. Patty, I think was next. I just had, um, just point of reference, you said that we've done, gone to referendum twice. It was five years ago, and when was the other? Uh, was like, it long like time? Three years before that. I yeah. think. Oh, so it was, they were kind of back to back, okay. Yeah. And um, I guess I will just say that I, I am in support of kind of, as you said, let this see the light of day again and dusting it off. I think it's in light of, you know, three quarters of a million to a million dollars in improvements that are people possibly want. It would make sense to at least revisit this and see if mm -hmm. it's something that makes sense. Um, so. I mean, one of the clarities in, in my little note to you folks was one of the things that was a real misunderstood, it was misunderstood in the last election keep it free. It's not free. <laughs> it's not free. It, it's never going to be free. <laughs> if, if we're going to have, we're going to entertain that kind of traffic, it's this cost, okay? But it was never clear to the taxpayer in Cape Elizabeth that they could go there for free and just have their transfer center, uh, transfer sticker on the car. But again, it was the technology five years ago wasn't what it is today. And it's a, it's a very passive system. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really you folks will be in charge and I... Uh, One last question. When you say pass the system, is that because there's nobody collecting it and whatever, they just go and pay? Is that what you mean? Yeah, and the ranger is the one that's uh, on duty making Enforcing. sure things okay. are... So and there's a whole... If you look at how these things are installed, in fact, the company that we talked to five years ago, according to Bob, is the same company that's doing Portland today. And there's a whole education process and sort of a, a burn-in period when you put these in. Okay. And we're really only talking about the four high t period times, July, August, September. You know, I mean, really, that's, we're not talking about all year round. I mean, these things are really just during that period. Mm -hmm. So it's passive in that it's, you know, I mean, it's not like putting, it's not like, well, what, what Higgins Beach is doing is they're putting parking meters in. Right. Hmm. Uh, and that's that's a very different approach, um, and maybe a little more, a little more in your face. But anyway, mm -hmm. it's. Uh... Other counselors, Jessica, <clears throat> and then Caitlin. You want to no, go ahead. Um, I support uh, Jim's request, and I commend him for this, because it's very forward thinking, um, and completely coincidentally, earlier this summer, I asked our town manager to create a performer for me because of 10 years of our expenses of the fort because I was thinking of next year as a town council goal on my own and and uh, was looking at the numbers because I I go to the park quite often and there were several days this summer where I couldn't even find a place to park my car <laughs> it was so mobbed and as some of you have heard me say before, when I was a kid, I would ride my bike in Fort Williams in the summer and not see another human being. I mean, it was, it's really astounding, the use that has developed, the, 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 the crowds that we have. But even more to the point, 
the needs that we have for maintenance, just maintenance, not to mention the bells and whistles that some of our citizens want. You know, that all costs money, and the taxpayer in Cape Elizabeth has been paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for this park for so many years. And it's a wonderful facility, but I think that the time has come to take a much closer look at this. And it also leads to a larger question, which is how do we pay for government? You know, and all the things that everybody wants. I mean, I, I can see this in a larger picture, but I, I think that this is something that it's gonna be well worth the council looking at. Um, and I also agree with Jim in that, uh, that the last referendum vote, I don't think it was clear to people that you know, a Cape Elizabeth resident could likely use a transfer sticker and not pay because we've been paying for years. Um, but anyway, I think this is very worthwhile to look at and I think that um, it's, a, it's an important fiscal consideration. Caitlin. Well, I appreciate Jim's thought of bringing it back up, but I don't support the idea that we need to be relooking at the fee for the park. I remember the referendums, I guess, a little differently. They were very clearly one-sided in that if you listen to the people and everything that was said going into those referendums, they did not want in any way whatsoever there to be a fee for the park. Um, I would like, if we're going to be going down this road from the sound of it, it looks like we are, I'd like to broaden it perhaps a little further if we're going to be looking at the fort. Let's look at Fort Williams more broadly as to how to generate revenue and not just pigeonhole ourselves into this <clears throat> pay to display or, or whatever we are. We can package it into a much bigger discussion as a goal going forward as to revisiting all different revenue ideas instead of just revisiting one. Um, I, it, I, I, think that's, I think that's great. I mean, I, I'm, I'm open to, to that as well because, I mean, cause, because in the letter we received today, it mentioned opening up the space in front of the, uh, you know, the lighthouse right. as, a, as a golden opportunity to rent for weddings and other things. As it turns out, I think your brother oh, wanted brother. to do that, if I'm not mistaken, yep. and he was in front of us a couple of times to get that done, and it didn't happen in the end. But... I'm, I'm all for opening up that whole conversation, but, but you know, we've, we've, kind of, we've kind of exhausted where we are. There's a bit of an, there's elasticity in pricing in how much you can price the picnic shelter. There's some elasticity in a lot of that, so we may be bumping up against some of that. We have less concession than we had when we first started. We're, you know, we're making $15,000 now, and we were making forty-five at one time. So it's because we can't quite get the traction with people who want to do it. But I think broadening it, it, it that's a great idea, uh, because I think it doesn't, it doesn't leave anything on, on turn, you know, we're going to take every rock and look underneath and see what there is. So all good. Well, and I'm, I'm always interested in um, looking at the facts, you know, about what is it costing us? You know, what, what can we potentially make? Whether it's pay to display or other, you know, options. Um, because I was kind of shocked at how much more it's costing us. And I've been to the port many times and I was not familiar with how many people outside of Cape Elizabeth were using it. And I think that's great. I'm not being critical of that. But if we're going to you know, if we maybe ask them to pay $2 to park their car for a couple hours, I'm not sure that that is, you know, uh, is going to stop them from coming. Um, and I don't know that that's the, I don't th know that that's the number, but I'd like to take a look um, at the numbers. And so we know what we're dealing with, and then this decision can be made, you know. We're not going to proceed, we are going to proceed, we're going to do part of it and all of it, yeah. something completely else, so. So, Mike, are we sending a, enough of a message, or do you want some clarification? You know, I, I think you, you know, I've heard you want more background information, but I haven't heard any council action. I, okay. I've just heard discussion. So, Jim? I move that uh, you take up the uh, revenue opportunities for Fort Williams Park as a 2016 town council goal and I wouldn't limit it in any way. 
I think Caitlin's point is a, is a, is a very good one. Is there a second? Jessica? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Are we okay now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll move on to citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Is anybody here to talk about that? Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> um, then uh, I will ask, uh, and before I ask for a motion to adjourn, um, just a reminder that we meet again on October 19th um, for a workshop. Um, and unless it's changed, we're going to be talking about the recycling center study, paper street recommendations, and an update on the 2015 citizen survey that was included in the tax bills, which you got a preview of tonight and will be on the web tomorrow. So is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor. Thank you. We are adjourned. These are available electronically online. If you don't want the hard copy, we'll, we'll take them back if you'd like. There you go.